Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Neil here again. And in today's episode, we sit down with Matt Mason and Pablo Lopez of The Monumental Loop. Matt and Pablo have been working side by side in creating The Monumental Loop in Southern New Mexico. So in this interview, we chat with Matt and Pablo about what you can expect en route, some of the historical significance, and how the route came to be. We also chat about their hopes of making the Monumental Loop a nationally designated trail. Matt and Pablo were a joy to chat with and it was great to get a little bit more insight on the Monumental Loop. And if you wanna check out a little bit more on the Monumental Loop, be sure to check out our route section on our website. Uh, It has a variety of different routes that cater to all abilities. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you like what you see here, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and enjoy the interview. All right, Matt and Pablo, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. Um, how are you both doing? Doing great. Doing great. Yeah. Uh, this is the first time I took my mask off uh, all day, so I'm really pumped about that. So where are you guys right now? Are you guys in Las Cruces or El Paso? We're in Las Cruces. OK, that's what I thought. And what do you what do you both do for work? I am a Zoom kindergarten teacher all of a sudden, um, but normally I just stay at home dad. That's kind of taken on a new role here um, with COVID, but yeah, I'm a stay at home dad. Uh, I'm not nearly as important or uh, as essential as Matt. I manage uh, Outdoor Adventures, a bicycle shop, which is uh, all bicycle shops right now. Anybody who works or owns or manages them, I'm feeling for you guys and uh, just letting you know. Uh, we're trying to keep up the good fight here. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I, I would assume you guys are just, you probably can't even get a hold of bikes right now. Um, is the service department starting to tick up too now that you guys like the riding season is actually kind of starting back up again? Uh, absolutely. It's gorgeous here right now. It's just about ready to get into prime bike packing season really. But, uh, the, the blow is coming where uh, parts are now unavailable, not just bikes. So uh, the service department's taking a, uh, a lick in a little bit because we can't really necessarily put new parts because they're just none to put on. Is that both like a, a Shimano and SRAM issue or um, one or the other? Any any brand. If you got an eight-speed uh, Campanello freewheel that needs replaced, there's going to be a lot of those. Uh, <laughs> no problem. You guys are looking good. All right, noted. Campy parts we can get. May, the main question here, how did you both get into cycling? Uh, I've b- ridden my whole life. I mean, even as a kid and grew up in Iowa, every summer evening after dinner, my family, we'd go out and ride, just ride the neighborhood. You know, the regular group of gang of kids riding all over town. Um, it wasn't until I moved to Las Cruces, though, that I really got into mountain biking. I'd always commuted and ridden a little bit of road bikes. But once I got here, that's when I started mountain biking. That was about 10 years ago. I, I would say that uh, first off, it started uh, in the uh, Barrios here at Las Cruces. I was the last kid of my generation of cousins and brothers and every uh, sisters, I mean, uh, that uh, actually learned how to ride. But I'm still the only one that is riding. Uh, I was a big chicken when I was a kid about everything, including learning how to ride a bike. So my sisters basically just would put me on the bike and then push me until I fell over and laugh at me. And I finally learned how to do it one day. And I never stopped. What do you know? (laughs) My sisters are still laughing at him, I'm sure. (laughs) Can you guys share with me, I've actually never ridden in New Mexico other than on the, the Great Divide mountain bike route. And I know that doesn't do it justice. So if you go out on a day ride, what can you expect? Unfortunately, you can expect some sand um, and lots of rocks. That's the main thing you're going to do. And the best part, though, is that you can get to that sand and rocks from town super easily, uh, almost always on dirt from downtown directly. And then, you you know, it's 500,000 acres of National Monument surrounding the town so the riding is sometimes you know tiresome or you know not to people's liking at first with the sand um but there's a lot of it and it's really beautiful out there and there's nobody out there matt matt's if you live where matt lives you're uh literally two minutes away from the desert and all this public land that he was talking about uh if you live where i live 
you're in where most people live, you're 15 minutes away from the same experience, which is not a lot of time. Um, so we're very lucky on that. Uh, I think some things that Matt excluded that you can also expect is uh, let's go with snakes. You know, always big fun, rattlers. Yeah. Uh, everything grows a thorn in the desert. Uh, it looks like it used to be at the bottom of an ocean. It still does, uh, even though the ocean is long gone. And it just started growing spiny things to survive. Uh, but you also get, surprisingly, uh, in my opinion, I think very surprisingly, uh, some of some of the, the better uh, vistas that you can experience with the Oregon Mountains, if, you, if anybody wants to look them up, uh, pictures of the Oregon Mountains, uh, wherever you are, you can never not see them. So you'll never get lost. <laughs> but, man, they're gorgeous. Uh, it's like a mini Teton kind of looking thing. Um, I, I encourage people to look them up if they can't come down here and see them. Uh, when COVID's over, we'll see you when you get here. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't mean to oversell it with the sand and rocks there. <laughs> but uh, uh, it really is beautiful. There's a spot, a few spots where you can see like 13 different mountain ranges. Um, and, the, and then you do, there's no trees. So you've just got this huge view, you know, so the sunsets and sunrises are obviously amazing. Um, and the varied terrain. I'd also like to add that you get to see the Rio Grande, which is quite possibly the most disappointing thing you see when people are here during bike packing season because it's just a uh, sandy ditch it's a wash no water and that speaks volumes of like some of the problems going on here that's a different story but yeah. i wanted to jump on with you too because you you both created the monumental loop what is it like how was it created what was the idea behind it uh, yeah, so I, I moved to Las Cruces in like 2009, and at the time there was sort of a debate on whether to make what became Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks National Monument to designate that as wilderness. And a lot of people at that time seemed to be against it. You know, they were afraid it was going to take away their hunting or their ranching or whatever they had done on the land before. So they were skeptical. Um, and it's the federal government, and here people are a little bit skeptical of the federal government. So. So I went to a debate with a couple of the senators and some people, and they were talking about the wilderness. And I didn't know the land very well myself. Um, but as a through hiker and sort of a long distance, you know, not a biker at that time, but I was a through hiker. I'm like, I'll just go do a big loop and see the land. And then so I can talk, you know, with, a, with an informed opinion about it and participate in this debate. Uh, that was 2009. I tried to hike it. It's super hard. It's sandy. There's very little water. And I got discouraged and kind of gave up on the whole idea. And then maybe 2015, I met, I started biking more. I met Pablo, a bunch of people from the bike shop. And I sort of thought, we just realized, like, the East Surly ECR came out, you know, big plus tires. I'm like, oh, now some of this terrain that seemed off limits or un, unenjoyable sort of opened up and we all got these fat bikes and that idea just sort of came back to life for me. Uh, and let, let's just right off the bat when Matt decided to, uh, and, his, and his beautiful family decided to come here, it was the community's gain. Uh, he did the diligent work. You heard the passion where he's like, you know, I'm going to go walk this just to even have an idea of how to talk to these people and engage honestly. Uh, locals didn't do that. So mm. Uh, our communities gained big time when Matt and his family decided to come down here. Uh, I basically got duped into helping Matt. <laughs> of course. Uh, he, might have, he might have been drinking. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I had just, I, I used to organize a lot of races and stuff like that around this area for a, a good few years. I was kind of burnt out. Uh, I told Matt, like, man, I'm done. This is, this is my last year. I'm kind of over it. And uh, we went on a camping trip one night where we took this guy from somewhere on the East Coast. And uh, we wound up at this place that's on the Monumental Loop. And uh, he was like, hey, you know, I got this idea for this thing. And I was hoping you could help me out with it. And I was just like, well, yeah, because it's, it's you. I'll help you out. And I didn't know it was going to be this this thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like four, four years later. And it, was, still... it was a tiny idea. Yeah. And then now it's just like, okay. And I'm still willing to help out, but I got duped. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So, what are what's kind of the stats then on the on the loop, and is it completed? Yeah, on the ground it is completed. I mean, you can ride the full thing. It's built. Uh, I used existing roads and trails sort of for the first version, 
And then as wilderness has been designated since and other land management stuff has changed, I've altered the route a little bit. Right now it's 350 miles, roughly. It takes in two national monuments, all four parts of OMDP and prehistoric trackways, it goes into Texas, into a state park down there. And what what is, you said OMDP? Yeah, yeah, it's the worst name. It's Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks. Okay. So the Oregon Mountains are like the big, you know, sort of the eye grabbing mountain range. And then there's like five other ranges in the, in the monument. And what's like some of the historical significance that you pass on through? Yeah, there's kind of a lot. I mean, there's, you know, there's cultural stuff going back 15,000 years or something, which I need to know much more about. Um, and then a lot of the culture and history here is you know, like from late 1500s when the Spanish came over. You know, a lot of the mountain ranges have the names of those first people that came with them, Yate and, and that stuff. Um, but there's Civil War stuff here, too. There's the Butterfield Trail. There's a place south, Kilbourn Hole, where they did testing for a moon mission. Yeah, there's all kinds of weird stuff uh, in the desert. <laughs> the prehistoric trackways is probably one of the biggest things where they actually found uh, these Permian Basin kind of like uh, big fossils and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, footprints in what uh, uh, in these old uh, ancient lake beds and river beds. Um, there's places down in the south, uh, what Matt named Cone Country, which, by the way, the BLM started using the term Cone Country because that's funny. Came up with it. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, where uh, mammoths used to rub against these big cinder cones, and you have these big smoothed out rocks where they used to like scratch themselves. And they're itchy bits. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and Ray Molina. Do you know Ray Molina? Ray. He's like one of the first guys that worked on fat bike rims. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He yeah. lives like down here in a little rattlesnake filled shack. Off like, the route. Ju just off the route. Yeah. And so he makes homemade, homemade liquor that he'll give you. And it's a wild <laughs> scene. Because <laughs> he Not was. On the route, but. He didn't. He he was maybe one of the the first uh, experimenters with fat bikes then. Yeah, absolutely. Because of the sand. Fat, yeah, he showed me a fat bike he made in 1996 or something. Wow. Some old GT. So yeah. there's bike history there too. Yeah. And let's not forget everybody's favorite, the big mushroom cloud that happened on the other side of those Oregon mountains. <laughs> the Trinity site oh. is about. Uh, 40 miles it's not far. just on the other side of the mountains yeah there's what test facilities are over there there's still yeah there's still white sands and fort bliss fort and bliss. nasa yeah. right in nasa got it so you can be riding sierra vista which is like a 30 mile national recreation trail beautiful down the front of the organs and you hear abrams tank fire like just a few miles away on the other side so for us the organs are like this beautiful backdrop and for them, it's like, we'll shoot their tanks into that backstop, essentially. So I think it was said best, uh, the organs have been under constant attack since the 1940s. <laughs> yeah. Word on the street is you potentially are trying to uh, designate it as a national trail. Is that accurate? Yeah, that is accurate. It seems far-fetched. It's always sort of been like my long range. Like, if I could just dream anything, I you know, and make it happen, that would be it. Um, but then Friends of Oregon Mountains, a local nonprofit, uh, their executive director, Patrick Nolan, he got excited about it. And he's like, is that something you want to pursue? And I mean, I don't know, I'm a stay at home dad, I don't know how to make a national scenic trail, but he has some skills in that and wants to to move forward with it so yeah it's happened what's well that's awesome what's what's kind of the process that you would have to go through to to make that happen i mean essentially you have to just convince congress to make it happen and then have a reasonable president who doesn't who doesn't uh veto that but yeah we just have to talk to the to the our senators and our representatives first and luckily we have relationships with them and they're super supportive of all of this i mean they're the ones that pushed for the monument designation and then the wilderness designation so this sort of feels like the next logical step to add a national scenic trail and it ties this you know there's four units of omdp it sort of tied the monumental loop sort of ties them all together so we're meeting with the senator senator heinrich's people and sort of talking to them and seeing what we can what we can make happen yeah there's a few little hiccups that are out there um, with some of the designation 
uh, of some of the land that the Monumental Loop uh, rides on. Uh, getting that ironed out is step one. Um, and then once that's ironed out, uh, I mean, it's uh, we, we work with a, a local representative, uh, Angelica Rubio, who uh, rides the Monumental Loop and parts of it, the, uh, the gravel parts of it and whatnot, uh, and takes it, actually helped us get the uh, New Mexico Bike Packing Network uh, bill, House Bill, written in uh, 2019, I think it was, House Bill 10, which uh, got recognized the fact that New Mexico actually has a system of trails that you can actually look on bikepacking.com that go from the Colorado border all the way down to the Monumental Loop, which hits Texas. And you can actually link them together if you piece together from your site, actually. <laughs> um, I got them to recognize, uh, write with some legislation and got them to recognize the New Mexico Bikepacking Network. So if you can work on these little things, then those bigger things, like the designation of a national trail, uh, and you have people that are helping you out that are excited about it, uh, it, it doesn't seem far-fetched. That's a that's a big big deal. Um, how many like what's I don't I've done very little research on designation like national scenic trail designations, but like there aren't that many of them out there, right? No, of national scenic trail, there's like fourteen or thirteen. I think. Okay, yeah. The big ones are the, like the PCT, the yeah. AT, the CDT, and then there's some other the North Country maybe you know Florida Trail, but yeah, it would be kind of an, like an elite thing. And I don't know if that's really possible. If you read the language, it may work out that we're more of a, you know, national recreation trail or, you know, some combination. I'm not really sure. There's a new American Discovery Trail. We sort of fit the bill for that designation, too. Well, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, you've got like the historical, cultural significance, the beauty, adding all that stuff together would be awesome. And I want to get down there like ASAP to get and ride that loop. Yeah, hopefully I can set the the re- the current record now is fifty three hours yeah. for the loop. So I'm gonna try to break that. Sweet. So maybe after that you can come smash whatever I do. <laughs> Lael wanted to come down and do that too, right? Yeah, yeah. I am not on that camp. I am all about taking about seven days and having like uh, fifteen different burritos and and beers from all sorts of cool places on the route. So just saying, you don't have to come smash. Cheers to that. <laughs> The trail, you can come smash some sick burritos. Yeah, green enchiladas. Ch- green chili capital of the world is on the run. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is. There is a green chili loop and a red chili loop. So, if you know, as long as uh, someone's bottom side can take it and there's no longer a uh, toilet paper, like, scare, come on down. Let's go over the loop a little bit more um, just to – kind of give people a better understanding there's kind of two main uh loops within the loop so kind of does it figure eight in, yeah it does, it does figure eight okay cool so mainly for water so people can get water that's that that's what i was going to say so how much water does one need to carry at one time uh i think if you're touring and you're sort of taking your time the average person touring goes you know 40 40 to 50 miles a day sort of at most and then i would say six liters is what I would recommend. Um, if you're going faster, you can carry much less, obviously. Um, I get away with four fairly easily. Uh, and there is water on the route. So if you're comfortable drinking out of, you know, sort of questionable sources, you can get by with less. Um, but they're cattle tanks. They often have cattle either standing in them or, you know, drinking out of them. And some people, that isn't appealing to them. But. Just for reference, what do you use to filter out of a cattle tank? I use a mini Sawyer or a Sawyer Squeeze, one of those. Okay. I have a MSR Micro Shot. Okay. Same yeah. thing as kind of like the Sawyer. Yeah. And Sweet. it works fine. It has a little cow taste, but, but you know. Yeah. If you're going fast enough um, and you have about four liters, you can filter. You don't have to filter. You can get water in town. Because um, it's only, you know, 80 miles, I think it's like 120. The longest stretch is 120 miles between, you know, 
a fresh water source. What what bikes do you both own, and what bikes do you ride on the uh, on the loop? I, I have a uh, old twenty six inch salsa bear grease. Uh, the, Sweet, like one of the carbon ones. Uh, it looks like a stormtrooper. It's white, you know, geared out different ways. It actually never even came with the. Um, the rack mounts on the front fork, it was pre that because mm-hmm. uh, it's the racing model, uh, what have you. But uh, I had a 26 inch tire, the rims I put on it actually make the the uh, tires kind of look more like a 3.25 instead of a 4 inch, like it's supposed to be. And I'd say that's plenty. Uh, I think Matt and some other guys like uh, even say like a 29 by 2.4 will get you. But in the sand, maybe you might want to run a three-inch at least, minimum. Yeah, I have a collection of Surleys with tires from 45 millimeters to three three inches. And then depending on how much it rained or where I'm going, uh, the best choice, I think, is like 2.8s or 2.6, something like that. A lot Most people like front suspension. Um, but I have an ECR and a Krampus and a Karate Monkey, and those all, they work great. There's also a gravel edition of... Uh, the monumental loop called Legitimate Reasons, uh, where you can actually just bring your gravel bike and uh, get on, get after it. You know. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask then, how much single track is on the monumental loop? I think it's about sixty-five miles, seventy miles, maybe. It's changed a little bit. There used to there's a trail called SST, which is just super ridiculous, rocky, slices your tires every time. I cut that off. But I've recently added some in the Franklin Mountains in Texas. Uh, the El Paso Puzzler, I don't know if you've heard oh, of yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that, a lot of that route is now on the Monumental Loop. What's that 29-mile single-track stretch north of Las Cruces there? Yeah, that, that's the start of the Southern Loop. It comes out basically right here by my house at Tortugas Mountain. And then total now with the Franklin Mountain section, Yeah. it's closer to probably 40 miles of continuous generally downhill single track <laughs> Ooh, that sounds good it, that's pretty rad yeah that section is great uh, i'd like to make a trail note right away uh it is a figure eight so you can get into town again and resupply which is makes a lot of sense but it actually is really uh a place to start where uh matt lives so matt can ride the monumental loop and matt created this loop so <laughs> yeah. it actually goes by his house twice <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me, so right? just letting you know if you ever get to the point where you're like about ready to restart it and you um there's a a chant that said uh, a lot of people that have come down to do this loop say uh f you matt mason if you ever want to say that when you have to restart the loop again you're right by his house yeah. <laughs> so please do it's ended up with angry people at my house more than once I'm like yeah of course you can park in my driveway and then they come back after one loop and they're like why are you doing this to me what is wrong with you? You did it to yourself. So so as far as like tire choices, 2.4 and up, and then durable sidewalls? Yes, Definitely. correct. Cool. That's right. Small knobs work fine, especially for the rear tire, run something, yeah. you know, fairly slick. But So outside of Hatch, what's like the best the best food en route? Where, where do people need to stop? Uh, it's hard to say. There's a lot of burrito places here <laughs> and a lot of really good food. Uh, But I did when I made the route, especially through town. That was like one of the parts where I was thinking, okay, where does it need to go? It needs to go by good restaurants, partly because bikepackers like to eat and partly because I wanted sort of that restaurant community to see bikepacking as a valuable thing. You know, so if they see bikes coming in all the time, they're going to when the chance comes up to support the loop, they're going to say, yes, we definitely support it. Um, with that said, I like habaneros. That's one of my favorites downtown. Chala's, Chala's Wood Fire Grill was really good. Chala's Wood Fire Grill. Uh, habaneros, I'll just add this right away. People come from all over the place, have a lot of food allergies. That's probably the cleanest food. It's all gluten-free. It's yeah. really, really clean. I'm just saying. Uh, but we got tons of breweries as well. Uh, honestly, you can even go to gas stations and get a burrito that'll not your socks off uh at the the santa fe grills they're a valuable resource they actually are in convenience stores (laughs) believe it or not Uh, and they have bathrooms at the convenience stores (laughs) you don't have to go in anywhere but this pickwick gas station really 
and there's one you know scattered you know nicely throughout the round and you'll get everything you need even like a fresh made burrito and now we have taken a lot of finishers to uh, and uh you can go there now of course covid times is different but uh, the Double Eagle in Messia, where the route actually kind of ends. Uh, award-winning margaritas at the Double Eagle are a great way to reward yourself. And when really, if you ride the loop, it doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to be, you know, Neil Belchenko. No. You don't have to be. But anybody that comes, we'll take, if you ride it and you want to talk to us after, or we'll buy you beer. We like hanging out with anybody that rides it just to get some feedback and, you know, just to meet some people. But Amen. Yeah, so hosp- hospitality has been a big thing. It seems that way. It seems like just like watching on Instagram, you guys definitely love to to take people in and and to chat with everyone and ride with ride with people. Like you have that whole community scene there, which is pretty awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of cool from afar. That's what it looks like, at least. Uh, it's all a lie, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's one place on route that people should know about? For a, like the awesomeness, and then another place that is just incredibly like, this sucks. Yeah, the Southern Loop is sort of both of those, I think. <laughs> <laughs> because it starts with that 40 mile, sort of gently downhill, amazing scenery on Sierra Vista Trail. And then you get to the Rio Grande and you sort of go west from there out into Cone Country, which is, has its own beauty. But it's 120 miles of sort of sandy, often very sandy roads. Um, and there's nothing out there. You know, you don't, you don't see anything. You see the border wall on this highway, and then you turn north, and it's just sand and cows. And, and it can, that section can be crushing, for sure. But you've just come off Sierra Vista, so you're kind of, you know, it's like riding that, riding that wave of extremes. Uh, I'd say if there's... Uh, something you, you can't miss. Uh, I, I'll agree with Matt, uh, by the way, uh, that the Southern Loop is the most, probably the most beautiful and actually looks like the most ancient and pristine part in, in parts of it. Uh, and then other parts right next to it, it's like overgrazed. So you get this really weird feeling about the land. So, and it's just terrifyingly hard. But uh, I'll also say that the one thing that you can't miss is hard to miss. Uh, that sunset and that sunrise, no matter where you are on the loop, just uh, take a moment. Everybody, please. Uh, it'll be one of the best. I guarantee it. Is there any plans on making the route any longer or amending it in any way, shape or form? Or are you both satisfied? I've sort of been amending it sort of every year, basically, since it since I first drew it up. Um, and we may have to amend it more. Uh, there's a couple sections where I would want to include this short section on Tanuco Mountain. It's this really neat little mountain with petroglyphs and cool mines and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but there's a small private land issue with a railroad. So I don't know how we're going to work that out. But as this designation moves forward, I'm hoping we can sort of agree on one route and then move forward from there. So I'm kind of holding the line right now on let's not move it just to solve the problem. Let's see if we can use this you know, sort of clout from the designation to solve those problems for us. So, because 80% of the route or more is on BLM land, and they've sort of given the green light on their section. Yeah, so I'm hoping it sort of stays where it is. Uh, I, I would say if there's really a way about talking about expanding it, it's going back to that uh, New Mexico bike packing network that I was talking about. No, it's not expanding the monumental loop. It's just letting people know that you can connect it. Um, there's already the connector. Uh, from Santa Fe, which is a, a, another storied route, again, that's on your site, but uh, all, all, all the way up to uh, the Valles Calderas and all that, the Conquistadoras loop that's on your site, all of it actually mm-hmm. connects all the way down. And I would like to expand what's already there just in the consciousness of people thinking like, oh, there's actually a New Mexico bikepacking route, believe it or not. It's yep. not necessarily an Arizona trail. Yep. It's got its own individual parts, but they actually can work together. Yeah, so yeah, like what Pablo's saying, for example, I guess, uh, the sort of a bigger thing here, the Tour Divide route, when it hits Silver City, it's mostly pavement after that, is yep. that right? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. basically, there's one stretch that's gravel and it's, not like anything to write home about and then the rest of it's yeah it's all pavement 
Yeah, that's sort of a bummer because from Silver City, you can take, you can follow roughly the historic Butterfield Trail, mm -hmm. sort of southwest to the Monumental Loop. And then from there, you can go all the way to Juarez, which is the border. Yep. It would be a much better finish. And then people would come to Las Cruces instead of finishing in the middle of Antelope Wells. In, in the middle of nowhere, yeah. In the middle of nowhere. I'm like, you could just take this beautiful dirt route. I mean, it's amazing. You um, know, there's little towering volcanic mesas with petroglyphs on them, hot springs on the on that. So that's not my jurisdiction. I don't know who to talk talk to about that. But. It is amazing, but it also would be another reason to say F you, Matt Mason. It would be a very hard finish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it'd be an adjust if you've ridden the Tour Divide, it would be a big adjustment because you're like, I have this, what, 80 miles of pavement I can pound out. Yeah. And instead, it would be 150 of sand. And it's all just like slightly downhill. It's just, yeah, it's kind of a nice uh, reward to finish off that that 2,700 mile route. But <laughs> that would be cool. For... I figure you're already there. You're so, str you know, you're so good. you're so strong, and you don't want to finish an Antelope Wells. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That just seems like the wrong place for me. But it could finish near an airport. <laughs> I like that idea though. That is a cool idea. Or at least just doing like the the northern stretch or the the uh, New Mexico stretch from north to south and and finishing in Las Cruces or you know or Juarez. Danger Bird is that still the name of the race or is it what what's going on with that and is it happening this year? It's not. It's not. That is the name of the race. Okay. Uh, it's not happening this year. Okay. And it's never truly been a race. A few people go fast. Um, it's more just sort of morphed into this bikepacking celebration or sort of kickoff to the real start of the season. We actually got designated, uh, what was it, uh, Monumental Loop Week yeah. from the city of Las Cruces to kind of kick off the start of bikepacking season, as we call it. Uh, of course, you can do it before that a little a little bit, probably not too much before that because it's really hot, but... Um, so it's kind of a celebration. Even like uh, we even in just encourage people to show up at the mass start, um, just to ride whatever distance you can with the people that are actually going to go for it, and or even just stay overnight somewhere. Uh, so it's yeah, it's like kind of a local celebration, I guess. The the danger bird. Yeah. Yeah. I still really like when people come and go fast, and I want to encourage that for sure. Oh, yeah. uh, but the more rewarding part has been getting local people out onto the place. I mean, they've lived here for 30 years, some of them. They're like, I've never been here. That's my favorite thing, when people have lived here forever. And they're seeing, they're like, I see this town in a whole new way because of these rides. I'm like, that's amazing. I'll keep doing this forever, you know, just for that, really, to Amen. be honest. So, my so favorite getting, too. getting local people out. Uh, Bailey last year, she, she'd done a couple bikepacking trips, and she's like, I'm going to go for it, and just goes out there and crushes it on the Southern Loop. And that's amazing to me. Yeah. That's awesome. I'd like Bailey Newberry to come down and yeah, he crush it. There. Yeah, I'd like to see what he could do too. But. He's a new new local of New Mexico for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, normally that's in October, late October though, right? Yeah, like sort of that last weekend of October. Yeah. I'd like to change that pronunciation to Rocktober, please. Rocktober. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> He awesome. never lets the opportunity to go by. No, say. you don't. It's good. <laughs> it's Pablo, I like it. I guess one last question. What uh, What's your favorite local trail in the area? That's not on the loop. How about that? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a cow trail that goes around this mountain north of town. Um, and that might be my favorite right now. It's made by these Brahma bulls that are out there. I guess most of them are cows, but these big, white, floppy-skinned Brahma cows run around out there. And Oryx from Africa. They've been introduced, and there's like 30 or 40 Oryx running around out there. What's an Oryx? Uh, it's like the two-horned African antelope, sort of okay. elk-sized. Okay. Very elk-sized. Yeah, and they run around all out there with these Brahma cows, which is a weird mix, and they make amazing trails. They just stomp yeah. it down. They just stomp it down, and it's perfect. It's like eight inches wide and just beautiful. I've been riding that a lot this summer. It does it change, like the location, or no? Did they follow yeah. that same trail? No, as you get closer to like the cattle tank where they're going to get water, uh -huh. it sort of comes together, and then in between, it sort of braids, and you sort of never take the same path twice. And yeah, 
That's, that's insane. I've never even seen this. <laughs> that's I'm, good. That's I'm good. really pumped. That's good. Uh, I would say, honestly, my, my favorite thing, especially during the whole Rona thing, um, is actually uh, I live downtown, and it's amazing how quick you can get onto some of these uh, laterals or ditch banks and just ride forever. Uh, probably 100 miles of just usable ditch banks between here, uh, Texas a New Mexico border and a hatch. What's a ditch and, uh, bank? Like, it, explain this the riding surface. Irrigation, irrigation okay. ditch. Uh, so, like, the, some people call it laterals on the side where the roads are. Got it. Um, where you can ride them. So and, it's uh, it's it's pavement. No, no, no. It's, it's like a dirt a dirt canal. You know, three four feet deep of water. Okay. In the irrigation season, and then on either side to maintain and open the dams, they have dirt roads essentially and they're ev everywhere in the valley you can get anywhere in the valley and to that's how you get from town to the monument as you follow these ditches and uh so the ones i usually take for my house aren't necessarily on the route but man you can go anywhere and that's probably been my favorite rona ride because i can just jump out my house and find myself in a different place all the time so i'd say come come ride some ditches ditches <laughs> <laughs> and with that thank you yeah um well thank you both for for joining us um i appreciate the knowledge i'm super excited hopefully not in the too distant future i can come out and, and ride the monumental loop because it looks awesome um and if folks that are watching or listening to this uh on bikepacking.com we have this route uh, and you can find it in our root section or just search uh, the website Monumental Loop. Uh, and it has all the information you need to know and the uh, Ride With GPS map. So again, thank you two very much for, uh, for joining me today. And uh, we'll chat with you two soon. All right. Thanks, Neil. All right. Thank you.